Yo, what up, City Point? It is so good to be able to be with you all again today. Happy Sunday, y'all. Um, this is our next installment of our series, Life Stages, and we are talking to the Mary people today. So I'm excited to be able to be with you all. I don't want to waste any time. Let's jump into a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump straight into this word. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much, God, for all we've experienced so far in this worship. I pray in Jesus' name that you will preach through me to these, your people. God, bless the married couples through this word. I pray, God, that you will make their marriage more rich, more enjoyable, more pleasurable uh, as a result of this sermon. Use me in your service, God. You take all the glory, honor, and credit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to preface by saying that this is not a sermon for the kiddos. This will not be a rated G sermon. It very much will be rated, I don't know, on the spectrum, but it ain't going to be G. So we're going to be talking about sex and we're going to be talking about body parts and all that type of stuff. Grown folks talk, um, as our parents would call it. So I want to respect the fact that... Um, um, this ain't for the kiddos, and for some people, they don't want their children learning from this stuff from their pastor. You want to have your own chance to teach them about this stuff. So, with that being said, let's take a moment. You go on and get the kiddos settled into something else to do, and then we'll jump right into this, um, jump right into this word. All right? So, I want to talk to the Mary folks this morning. If I had an entire series worth of sermons, I would indeed talk to the merry folks about uh, uh, things that span all the various themes regarding marriage. If I had an entire month to just talk to the merry people, I would do that. I would talk to you about uh, building a healthy marriage. I would talk to you about co-equality in marriage, about love, about persistent love, about ensuring that you've got time with each other and you're making time to date. I, I would talk about couples finance and family finance, and I would talk about communication and overcoming arguments and overcoming disputes. I would talk to you about all those things, but I don't have all that kind of time. I got one sermon. And so what the Lord has been tugging and pulling at my heart to talk about for this one sermon that I have for the married people, God has been tugging on my heart to talk about this thing called pleasure. You see, pleasure is not a topic that gets much airplay in religious spaces. I don't know if it is our prudeness as religious folks that causes us to ignore this topic or to think that it is taboo. Maybe it is our puritanical roots as American Christians that has caused us to closet any kind of talk about pleasure. I don't know exactly what it is, but we have this sort of timidity about talking about pleasure. Certain kinds of pleasure, right? Because it's okay to talk about pleasure as it relates to God's pleasure, right? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God or to bring God pleasure. So we're comfortable talking about pleasure as it relates to pleasing God. But this thing called pleasure as it relates to, you know, sexual pleasure, that thing, that type of pleasure is missing from Christian discourse. That, that thing, I'm sure for some of you even, seems a little bit awkward right now hearing your pastor. Some of y'all are cringing right now hearing your pastor talk about pleasure and knowing that I'm pivoting into talking about sex at church. But, but that's exactly why I'm talking about it today. It is because I'm hoping to liberate us, to move us to a place of seeing sexual pleasure as not some evil, dirty thing, but to see it as God-given, as God-sanctioned, a thing that is okay for us to desire, for us to deliver, and for us to even deserve as married Christians. The Bible says in the Psalms that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I want you to think about that for a second. Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We know that we are a part of God's creation. In fact, we are the crown jewel of God's creation. And if we were to stop for a second and think about how God created us and made us into sexual creatures, think about this for a second. Consider how when you look at the makeup of the human body, 
that God intended for sex to be about more than simply procreation, but actually to bring us some pleasure. Think about this. The, the, I'm going to talk about body parts here, so y'all get ready. Uh, the, the male penis has an estimated 4,000 nerve endings, and the female clitoris has an estimated 8,000 nerve endings, and the pelvis has 15,000 uh, nerve endings. If you believe that God has intentionality around how God created us, then it is hard to ignore that sex was not merely meant to be utilitarian, but is an act of giving and receiving pleasure. And so I say to the married couples out there, I say to all of you folks that are married, I say to you that you do not need to be ashamed that you enjoy that pleasure, that you crave that pleasure. That is a healthy part of marriage if you both consent and commit to the act of bringing each other pleasure. Now, pleasure may not have been a topic that was in your Sunday school when you were growing up in church, but, but I will suggest to you that pleasure is right there in the Bible. I promise you, I absolutely promise you it is. Go with me to Genesis chapter 18, verse 12. Now, before I read it, Genesis 18 and 12, let me give you some context. Abraham is old at this point. Abraham's like 100. Sarah is like 90. Abraham is chilling outside, and then all of a sudden, there are some dudes that walk up to Abraham. At first, he thinks these are just people that are travelers, that are visitors, but it is actually a theophany. A theophany is an Old Testament uh, sighting of God, right? Like it is when God comes to us in bodily form, right? You see this several times throughout the Old Testament where this happens. This is a, these are called theophanies. And so one of these dudes that he thinks is just a dude is actually God. And so in this situation, um, um, Abraham entertains this group of people that happens to include Yahweh and, and uh, Abraham makes sure they have food and he entertains them. And then just as they're getting ready to leave, um, um, the Lord is like, yo, Abraham, about this time next year, Sarah's going to have a son. Sarah overhears this. She overhears these words that come um, from the Lord and Sarah's response is, is here in the text, right here in Genesis 18 and 12. This is where we pick up. It says, so Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am worn out and my Lord, that's her word for her husband, is old, shall I have pleasure? Another translation, the Good News translation puts it this way, perhaps better. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, now that I am old and worn out, can I still enjoy sex? And besides, my husband is old too. I want to propose to you that embedded in Sarah's reply is both a reminder and a liberatory statement regarding sex. That although sex carries with it a utilitarian function of creating children, it also carries with it the purpose and function of delivering and receiving pleasure. You know the story of Abraham. Many of you do. I, I don't want to go all into details about the, the narrative of Abraham and Sarah. Uh, but, but I do want to remind you just contextually that 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 Abraham had received a promise from God that God would make him the father of many nations. There's just one little problem that Abraham has. He ain't even a father. God has given Abraham this promise, and it seems that Abraham, in order to be a father of many nations, he would at least need to start out by being a father. But he and Sarah have been unable to conceive a child together. And so uh, because of this, they do not have a child. Abraham does not have an heir. By the time of this passage, again, Abraham and Sarah are 190 years old, respectively. They have moved beyond the age where many consider it is even possible to conceive children. We, we learn in verse number 11, right? Chapter 18, verse 11, where in some versions of the Bible, it says that the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. What the author of Genesis literally is trying to communicate to us is that all of the typical biological things that happen in a woman's body to help her conceive children is no longer happening biologically. 
physically with Sarah at her age. It is also worth noting that some scholars suggest that there was this popular belief amongst people during this time and in this place that child conception required female orgasm. Uh, in essence, the belief uh, was that in order for pregnancy to happen, that during intercourse, it was not simply necessary for the brother to get his, but that in order for child for, for conception to happen, the woman had to get hers too. This is important to understand because it helps us make sense of what is happening in the context because when Sarah overhears that by this time next year she would conceive a son, she laughs to herself and then says to herself, now that I am old and worn out and my husband also is old, will I have pleasure? It appears that Sarah subscribes to the cultural idea that in order for conception to happen, there would have to be some pleasure involved in the act, which is why she asked the question sarcastically, will I have pleasure? Although we don't understand some, although you and I understand some things scientifically that Sarah did not understand regarding the requirements for conception, I believe that we need to not gloss over or move too fast over what Sarah said. We, we need to not move too quickly past that. Because I believe that, there, that Sarah's connection between sex and pleasure speaks a word to many Christians, to married Christians who would have an ear to hear. Here's the word that I think that it speaks to all of us married Christians, that it is godly to desire to deliver and internalize that you deserve pleasure in your sexual experience. Let the church say amen. Can I tell you, first of all, that it is okay for you to desire pleasure? It's okay for you to desire pleasure. Sarah's statement allows us to peek past the veneer of prudeness that is so often displayed in American Christianity. And what Sarah does for us is Sarah gives us liberation to think about sexual pleasure in a godly way. The fact that the writer of Genesis decides to report out this aspect of this matriarchal figure reminds us that certain modern religious ways of, of talking about sex and sexuality and talk about pleasure are unnecessary. These religious ways that try to hinder us from talking about sex are unnecessary. Uh, Sarah, Sarah liberates brothers and sisters to have a voice and agency and not feel ashamed of, ze of their desire to have pleasure in their intimacy. In short, what I'm saying is, sisters, it's okay to like sex. In short, what I'm saying is, brothers, in fact, the fact that almost daily some of us may desire to have pleasurable sex does not imply that there is something wrong with us, that something needs to be fixed about us, that we need to learn better control of ourselves, that we need to manage our feelings more. What Sarah's statement about pleasure in Scripture gives for us is liberation to feel that it is okay to have these desires for sex and for sexual pleasure. It is in Proverbs but the writer then picks up pen and parchment in Proverbs 5 and 18 and writes the words, Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Let her breast satisfy you always. It is all right to desire pleasure. If you want a good word about pleasure, you should take some time to read through Songs of Solomon or Song of Songs right there in the Old Testament. I don't believe it's an allegory. I believe that it is literal and it is a story that is there. It is simply about two people longing for physical intimacy with each other. I think that for the married folks, that is a word of God for the people of God. But lest I keep you too long, not only is there a word about desiring pleasure, but there is also a word, secondly, about delivering pleasure. When you look at the text, what Sarah is inquiring about is both the question about herself and Abraham. See, see, in the text, she references her own age 
right? She talks about the fact that she was waxed old. Some scholars translate it as her literally saying, after I have dried up, shall I, uh, shall I have pleasure? Um, but not only does she make reference to herself, she also makes reference to Abraham. She says um, something about herself, and then she says, and my husband is old too, shall I have pleasure? So, so her question is centered around both her abilities and Abraham's ability to deliver. Both those things are part of her sarca sarcastic question about whether or not she would have pleasure. What it suggests to us is that pleasure is a two-way street. P pleasure is about the one who receives as well as about the one who does the delivering. And here, I'm talking across genders. Pleasure is about both individuals and their responsibilities. Let, let me give you this illustration. We are in the midst of a pandemic, and, and suddenly the entire world has gone digital. Whole world has gone digital. Church is digital. We're digital right now. Meetups are digital. Some birthday parties, a lot of birthday parties are digital. They're happening right on Zoom. Um, I, all of a sudden, we have shifted as a society into a space where it was almost not even an option for people to be computer illiterate. It was, a, it was a whole big shift for some people. But some people have decided that even though technology is not my thing, I'm going to figure it out. They've decided to not be embarrassed to ask questions, to research, to try to figure out how to use technology and to even be okay if something doesn't work out the first time. Yeah, when it comes to technology, some people have pushed past embarrassment and invested in learning how to work it. I've got a question for the married folks at City Point this morning. Have you invested time in learning how to work it? Have you invested time, energy, attention, reading, asking questions to understand your partner and what brings them pleasure? Have you invested any time in learning how to work it? You see, pride can make us believe that we know how to work it, but let me challenge you that if you have not, you need to become a student of your partner to learn how to work it. In the book, She Comes First, The Thinking Man's Guide to Pleasuring a Woman, the author lays out the principle, the one principle above anything of prioritizing the sexual pleasure of one's partner above one's own. It's basically the principle of good customer service that satisfied customers look forward to coming again. Let me rush along here and say thirdly and finally, the text liberates us to feel that we deserve pleasure. You see, what happens here in the text is that Sarah expresses agency by talking about her own pleasure. And she raises an important point for all of us that we don't have to and should not settle for seeing pleasure as simply a bonus when it comes to our physical intimacy but rather we see pleasure as being both part and parcel of the experience, that it should be a part of it, that it must be a part of it, that we expect it to be a part of it, that we do not simply expect ourselves to be tools to deliver that pleasure to other people, to that other partner, um, but that pleasure is something that we deserve to be able to expect and it is okay for us to voice what it takes for us to achieve that pleasure. Let, let me close this sermon um, first by telling y'all thank you for sitting through 20 minutes of your pastor talking about sex and not turning off the computer. But let me close this sermon just by saying that for too long and too often, the church has ignored these aspects of sexual pleasure that are deeply intertwined with how God created us and made us to be. 
And, and I hope that this sermon is a push to liberate us, to liberate, a, liberate us to feel that it is okay to desire it, that it is important for us to deliver it, and that doggone it, we deserve it in our physical relationships. I, I leave you with this. Um, me and my barber, we had this conversation one time. We, we were talking, and, and Barbara put me up on this book. And so I went and got the book. When I got the book, I got a bunch of other books that were related to that book. These were all about intimacy. And, and then me and my homies had this long text chain. And, and, and I will never forget, like, coming home, and, and I had this big stack of... Uh, of like five books that were related to intimacy. And, and, and my wife was very curious and very impressed, mind you, because it communicated something. And, and I bet that this will happen to any of you with your partner, that they will be equally as impressed and pleased because it communicated that I wanted to become a student a master of this thing called sexual pleasure as it related to my partner. Because here, here's where we get it messed up. We, we can believe that some relationships, some encounters, some previous escapade that we have been involved with, that what was successful there, what brought pleasure to that partner is the thing that will bring pleasure to this partner. No, nah, no, nah, player. It's it's all different. But being a student, being interested and being invested in what it takes for that person, that's real intimacy. And I believe that it pleases God. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for giving us a chance to dig into this subject of pleasure. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will have challenged us, that you will have pushed us, um, and that we will do something with it. I pray these blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen.